this is our agenda for today. Uh, let me back up. Sorry. So I'm Connor. Uh, this is my colleague Balaji. We're working in the uh, software-defined infrastructure group at Intel, um, and we've been working on in the Kubernetes community for the last uh, few months so far. Um, so we've got two main topics tonight um, that are recent additions yeah, to the code base. So the first one is called Node Feature Discovery, which was hinted at um, in the previous talk about NVIDIA resources. Um, and then our next topic will be opaque integer resources, which is a way to extend, um, a, kind of a first step of a way to extend the resource model in Kubernetes. We'll talk more about what that means. So um, we'll finish up with some future work. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Balaji, who will talk about Node Feature Discovery. Hello. So this is about uh, Node Feature Discovery. It's a Kubernetes incubator project right now. So uh, we want to expose uh, the uh, heterogeneity in terms of hardware features and platform configuration uh, to users so that they can um, uh, place some specific streaming constraints uh, when they want to land on nodes with certain features or platform configuration. <coughs> so all nodes are not the same in the cluster, so we want to enable users to express preference for certain hardware uh, or other features of platform types. So that is what we are trying to solve here. So the project is uh, about discovering hardware features and configuration on a Kubernetes node and it exposes these discovered features and configuration for our workload scheduling. So uh, it works by deploying a discovery container on each node of the Kubernetes cluster. The container discovers some hardware features and some configurations and adds a label uh, for each of these discovered features and configuration. So this is how the CLI looks. Uh, we expose some options. So basically, there is a set of sources or feature sources uh, that we have. So there is a default set of features. One is CPU ID, uh, and then the P state, and then RDT. There is also a dry run mode which, which uh, you can use to just uh, uh, not publish labels to the API server. And also there is a whitelist white option wherein you can run the uh, no feature discovery software in a dry run mode and then choose what labels or features that you want to expose in the cluster uh, depending on uh, using the label whitelist option. So the node labels that are uh, advertised uh, contain certain information in them. One is the namespace. <coughs> right now the namespace is that and uh, um, a prefix to denote that uh, it was it was, the, the label was advertised by NFD or Node Feature Discovery and then the source of each of the label, for example CPU ID uh, and then the discovered feature, it could be LDX or AESNA uh, from CPU ID. Uh, right now, uh, the Node Feature Discovery software only exposes binary features and uh, it only publishes the string true. So for example, uh, a label could be the namespace which is the node.alpha uh, string that we're looking at, and then the prefix NFD, and then um, the source CPU ID, the feature AESNI equals true. So if it exists, it'll, it'll be just uh, advertised with that label. Yeah. So, so the idea of the source is to make it hierarchical, like like so that, can, like the source plus the name is like it's sort of like two levels of a hierarchy. Or why why do you have why what is the purpose of the source part? Uh, so we just wanted to make sure, like, uh, so it is for a hierarchy, so we wanted to make sure that the cluster administrator and the user knows that this uh, feature came from this source, so that's why we are exposing those as labels. It's also use, sorry, um, so the label whitelist is a regular expression, so it's something you can hang off of when you're filtering things. So you can say, like, everything from this source, or yeah. not everything from this source. Yeah, okay. Let's see. So we'll start with a simple illustration. So um, you create the discovery job, the discovery pod lands on each of the nodes in the cluster, uh, and then it uh, advertises a bunch of labels 
depending upon what it discovers on each of these nodes. So uh, with that, I would like to show a simple benefit of a feature discovery uh, with an example feature, which is Turbo Boost or Turbo Mode, which is overclocking of CPUs when there is thermal headroom. Uh, and we'll be using an existing scheduling feature, Affinity and Anti-Affinity, which um, David uh, talked about in his uh, talk. Um, first thing uh, is simple illustration of affinity to a feature. Uh, this is Turbo Boost. Um, the setup is like we have three hosts and uh, we run a single benchmark 10 times on each of these, uh, so 10, 10 times across the cluster um, with them without affinity and show the performance benefits uh, of uh, having these features exposed. So the benchmark that we run is uh, a Ferret benchmark from a Parsec benchmark suit. So and it does an image similarity search. Uh, so uh, this is how you uh, use a node selector. So for example, uh, you want to land this pod on a node which has Turbo Boost enabled. So you want to land this pod on with that uh, node selector. So, so first thing is we, when we create a pod uh, without affinity, uh, it can land on any node. But if you create a part with affinity, uh, it will land only on the host which has Turbo Boost enabled. So, so the hypothesis here is that uh, two thirds of the time, the pods will run on nodes without Turbo Boost, uh, without affinity. So we expect to see performance improvement and reduction in performance variability as well uh, because of our affinity to certain feature. So this. Uh, this, this just shows a box, box plot. On the y-axis you see uh, percentage variation in uh, normalized execution time. Uh, zero being the best performing uh, application. Uh, so on the left hand side you see a pod running with discovery, that is affinity to turbo boost in this case, and then without discovery. So you see that the, uh, there is also, not only there is a performance improvement, but also the, uh, the performance variability is also reduced across the 10 brands that we have. Next is a simple illustration again uh, with respect to anti-affinity to a feature. Again, the, we use the same feature, Turbo Boost. Uh, the benchmark used is uh, probably from um, Antivo Benchmark Suit. It's a mini app which um, simulates hydrodynamics equation. So the methodology is again the same. Uh, we run the pod 10 times with and without anti-affinity. And then we show the uh, performance results from, a, from this uh, experiment. So this is a simple illustration of how do you, how you specify anti-affinity for a feature. Um, so again, like we create a pod without anti-affinity, uh, it will land on any of the hosts. But if you create a pod with, with anti-affinity, it will land only on the uh, two hosts where Turbo Boost is not enabled. And um, the hypothesis is that one third of the time this pod will run on nodes without um, Turbo Boost enabled, and uh, you expect to see similar results. So uh, this is a similar box plot. Uh, on the y-axis, it's the same same um, metric. It's a percentage variation in execution time, and you see that there is reduction in performance variability. Also, there is performance improvement across runs. Uh, this is one of the feature. We also expose other features. Uh, this is a partial list of features that we expose. If you, if you want to look at the other features that we expose, you can go look at our uh, repository. Um, of course, contributions are welcome. Uh, if you have run into any problems using this software, please submit an issue and uh, let us know if you find it useful. So with that, I will <coughs> uh, we'll talk about the tech integer resources. Okay. Well, opaque integer resources, which will is on track to ship in the next version, which is version 1.5 in uh, mid-December. Um, what problem does it solve? It's, in a way, a first step towards extending um, the Kubernetes resource model. Um, so there's a finite number of resources that are represented in the Kubernetes resource model right now. Um, and so if you have need to track, keep track of anything else, um, you're, you're a little out of luck until 
uh, this feature, which allows you to at least keep track of things in the scheduler. I'll get I'll get more into what it does and what it doesn't do. Um, so the high level is that it allows you as a cluster operator to advertise some countable thing, and then it lets your <laughs> users that are submitting pods to the system consume uh, some fraction of those things that are available on a node. Um, we'll talk about more use cases too. Um, and so just to kind of like set um, set the stage a little bit, say we have two vectors of support for a resource. One would be isolation, another would be accounting. Um, and so if you look at you know first class isolation and first class accounting, that's what you get out of the box with Kubernetes. So you have support for CPU shares and, and uh, CFS quota, um, memory limits, pod slots, so there's a limit to the number of pods that you can put on a given node. And then there's also NVIDIA GPUs, which is implemented. Um, a couple of these members of the cross product don't make any sense. So first class accounting, you wouldn't really, you know, not isolate those things. And then things that the system doesn't know about, you wouldn't have isolation for those things. But in this space over here, that's probably where we may want to um, add some extension, extensibility mechanisms, and that's the space that OAR fills. And in particular for phase one, which is what is implemented in 1.5, it's the far right slot. <coughs> we're, we're addressing only the accounting piece of these um, extended resources and not the isolation. That's a piece that remains to be solved. Uh, so what is it? It's support for a custom case of special resources, um, and they're integers. So not any scalar, just an integer. Um, the scheduler accounts um, these resources for you at the node level, and then pods can consume them just like the native resources. So they show up in the same section of the pod spec that Vish mentioned, the request and limit. Um, they just have a big, ugly name because they're alpha for now. Um, and then there's also validation checks that have been added to the API server to make sure that um, that quantities that you specify with those uh, names are actually uh, integral. Um, okay, so jumping into the mechanics, I guess this assumes a little bit of knowledge about how um, about how Kubernetes works at a low level, but we'll walk through uh, an illustration of the, of the process after this. So. Um, so the first thing that happens is that you submit a patch request over HTTP to the API server, and you're, act you're actually patching the, uh, the node object, um, which is a, a resource in the API server, to add an opaque integer resource. So you say, this capacity you know, that previously didn't include this thing, now it has 10 bananas. Um, and then the node allocatable resources are updated when the kubelet does its periodic sync with the API server. Um, so it does its sync, it looks at the API server, it sees that it has some extra capacity that it didn't see before, and it copies that quantity over to allocatable. Um, and the reason to do that is to avoid a data race with the scheduler, um, because the scheduler is actually looking at the allocatable field um, to see if pod, a pod fits, but the node is going to check that again when the pod lands there. So if the scheduler sends a pod before the node knows it has that capacity, it'll get rejected. So um, that's just a way to avoid uh, flapping pods unnecessarily. Um, and then the third part is that the scheduler allows pods to consume those resources. So it's a, you know, it's a little extension in one of the predicates that David mentioned. Um, just to make sure that you know the the capacity I've already handed out isn't exceeded when you try to land that pod on that node, um, and then as mentioned before, the API server does a little bit of validation. Oh, okay. Uh, so the setup is as before. We've got three nodes, and first step is going to be patching the node capacity. <coughs> So we issue an HTTP patch, and we're saying that host2 now has um, some quantity of uh, opaque resource. And then the kubelets sync with the API server. And now 
host two knows about the capacity that the operator has advertised for it. Um, so we actually have a small video of what this looks like. So, Vlad, you want to? Can they see this? Okay, perfect. Oh, yes. Anyways, uh, I'll just play this and then uh, give you guys a follow on with the demo. So the setup is we have two nodes, uh, 8.102 and 8.103. So first we look at the capacity. You see that uh, the native resources are reported here. CPU, memory, uh, and then the NVIDIA GPU. We also look at the allocatable. Again, you see that uh, the three uh, resources, <coughs> CPU, memory, and NVIDIA GPU are uh, reported there. Um, we just watch for changes uh, in the node status capacity and allocatable. Then uh, this is the patch. As Connor mentioned, uh, this is patching the uh, capacity of the cluster. Um, so it, it has a resource foo with value 12, which is an integer. And we patch the uh, capacity of 8.102. Um, so we first pass the cluster, sorry, pass the node. Um, and then uh, you see that uh, the capacity has been uh, updated in the API server. On next kubelet sync, uh, the kubelet up updates the capacity as well as the allocatable. And that's it. That's how you patch the capacity of the cluster. Okay, um, so step two is scheduling. So starting with a clean cluster, um, we create a pod that has the request for some, for some quantity of that opaque integer resource. Um, and at that point, since there are no nodes with that resource, the pod goes pending. Just as if you had run out of CPUs or memory or, or whatever else you're keeping track of. Um, and so we do the patch, we wait for the sync, um, host2 has the resource, and then the scheduler actually does its own sync with the API server to update its caches. Um, at that point, it can schedule the pod. Uh, yes, <laughs> the pod goes running. Um, we can see that in action in uh, this next small video. <laughs> Are we very short on time? We are over. Oh, okay. okay. We can probably skip that part. It's okay. um, it's just some text that flies by when we do what we just said we did. <laughs> <laughs> As with all demos. As with all demos <laughs> that don't have a UI. Um, okay, so just to wrap up, um, let me make this bigger. Uh, so looking forward uh, with our participation, um, we're looking forward to participating in the roadmap uh, for resource management for 2017, uh, both planning and implementation. Uh, we want to contribute to feature stabilization and maturity efforts um, around resource management in particular. And we want to help pursue an extensible resource model. So OER is just the first step. Um, it's kind of the first obvious thing. There was a long-standing issue, so it kind of it fills a gap and lets people start to um, you know do some experimentation on the side. Um, but we have to discuss with the community what it's going to look like in, in the long run. Um, and then continue to work with uh, customers and support their use cases. <laughs>